So if you have been in the Modulars community for quite some time now, you will have seen some changes in the appearance, in the general appearance in uh, social media, for example. Martial arts are suddenly exposed as fake, and this happens to a lot of martial arts, to really, really a lot of martial arts, especially also traditional martial arts, but also to certain aspects of combat sports, certain styles of, for example, BJJ or uh, kickboxing, some sorts of uh, boxing styles are questioned, whether or not they are actually useful. And with those words, hello, welcome to this episode of Sunday Documentary React, where we are every week reacting to some new content, some new martial arts and fitness documentaries, a little bit to challenge the mind, I would say. And we do this every Sunday. So if you want to see some more, then subscribe and don't watch the uh, don't miss the next episode, I would say. So we're watching today why martial arts are suddenly being exposed as fake. And this is a video I have come across, I think, two days ago. It's a 20 minute video. We're probably gonna double it in length. We'll see. It's about uh, from a guy, Tuffy2. And I already watched a little bit from the video just to see what it's all about. And I really said it's it's quite some good stuff in there. So without further ado, I would say let's hop in and see what it's all about, right? Okay, let's pump up the quality here and let's go. Hey, 42 here. Frank Dux was a fighter. When he was a teenager, he was taken under the okay. wing of a master named Senzo Tiger Tanaka and trained in the ancient art of ninjutsu. Senzo was a world famous teacher and descendant of 40 generations of warriors. Taking to the art very quickly, Dux became Senzo's greatest pupil. But his master was an old man, and after teaching Dux all of his knowledge, he passed away, making only one request of Dux before he did. He must compete in the Kumite, the Kumite. and become the first Westerner <laughs> ever to win the trophy. The that Kumite sounds like a bloody legend. A <laughs> mythical, no holds barred, 60 round single elimination. 60 rounds? <laughs> It had been heard of, spoken about, but rarely had anyone actually ever seen it. It was supposedly a long-standing tournament where the greatest martial artists from all over the world came and fought to the death. But it was only held once every five years, so Dux had to wait. During this time, he entered the Marines and was awarded the Medal of Honor for covert operations he undertook in Southeast Asia. It was during this time that Dux gained black belts in Taekwondo, and became a master of knife fighting. But in 1975, he heard a whisper of something shocking. The Kumite had been announced and his chance to fulfill his late master's dying wish had come true. Going AWOL from the military, Dux traveled to the Bahamas, sought out the tournament and began the fight to honor his master's legacy. And that he did, because Dux became the first ever Westerner to win the tournament. But not only that, he scored 56 consecutive knockouts, one of which was incredibly in 0 0.12 seconds. Wow. Both I don't think there's footage of that. World <laughs> records. Because of this incredible <laughs> performance, Dux was deemed the honor of being the first person to be allowed to publicly speak about the Kumite. After this, Dux returned to the army and began undertaking covert ops, both for the military and the CIA playing a role in operations in Central America during the 1980s. He also began forming his own martial arts schools, where he could pass on the knowledge he'd learned from his own masters. It was during this time that the incredible story became more widely known, and was even the basis for the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie Bloodsport, for which Dux was hired to be the fight coordinator. The film was a huge box office success and instant cult classic massively increasing Frank Dux's notoriety, which off the back of, he created his own martial arts dojos, and even, bizarrely, being offered $25,000 to kill Steven Seagal, of all people. Through listening to this astonishing man's story, it would be unsurprising if you thought him to be the greatest warrior who ever lived. But all of these events and achievements aren't the most astonishing or even most interesting detail of his life. The most incredible you see what he did here you see what he did he made up a story to follow us and to bring you uh, through um, the video that keeps you interested in the video and 
introduces this theme of what he's talking about now, I suppose. And that's really, that's, you see a great, con uh, great content creator, really. That's awesome. Incredible thing about Frank Dux is that it's all complete bullshit. He made it all up. It was all a lie. Presumably made up by Dux to build his own reputation and profit from it. A lie believed by so many that it made its way to Hollywood. But the truth is that there's no record of a Senzo Tanaka ever existing. Dux's only military records say that he fell off a truck and never left San Diego. And the one supposed witness to <laughs> Dux's incredible life story later revealed he had been coached by Dux on what he should verify. Dux was eventually entirely exposed by the Los Angeles Times. The world of martial arts is incredibly Let's go. dangerous. Now we're getting to it. The essential principle is to teach you how to hurt people and protect yourself from harm, but also because that's there's not an all, ironic but okay. catch 22 inherent within most martial art disciplines. What if the martial art you're learning cannot actually protect you, and your very faith in it exposes you to more danger? With martial Okay, what if this is the case? Let's switch this up here. What if the martial art you're learning is not protecting you? Then it depends on whether or not that was your purpose. I mean, if you go to a martial arts school and you learn something like modern wushu, that is clearly nothing for self-defense. That's for acrobatics, flexibility, performance-based reasons. And if you're honest about it, what you're learning, then that's, I mean, completely fine. If that's what you want to learn, then there's no problem. There's no, um, there's no difference between what you expect and what you are going to get out. But if you learn something like, for example, a lot of traditional martial arts or some traditional martial arts, and you think that, okay, this is going to protect me when I'm out with my friends. I can protect my girlfriend at the bar at the club when she's sexually being harassed or something like this. And but you don't train accordingly, then that's going to be a problem because then what you expect is not going to match the outcome. And this is where we see the problem. Yeah, just my two cents on that. Having faith that your teachings can actually defend you during a fight can be a matter of life or death. It if can. You believe one plus one equals three, you'll probably struggle with maths and be the victim of ridicule. But if you believe you know how to stop a knife with a self-defense technique and it proves to fail, you could end up very, very dead. Whereas most very dead. beliefs Indeed. put you at odds with others, incorrect martial arts beliefs put you straight on track for an arse kicking or a better to morgue. Luckily, the days of martial arts hearsay in which figures like Frank Dux thrived is rapidly becoming a thing of the past. Yes. And there is one major reason why the emergence of MMA. Although MMA or mixed martial arts in some format has existed since ancient Greece, in recent decades it has grown hugely in popularity to the point where fighters like Conor McGregor and Ronda Rousey are household yeah. names. And the industry brings in hundreds of millions each year, and its popularity is easy to explain. Whereas, yeah. I mean, such tournaments have existed, man. Also in traditional martial arts, because man, it's we talk about a tradition and the people they weren't just doing forms. I mean, the people fought hundred years the same way that people are fighting, or mostly the same way as people fighting in nowadays. Because man, a jab is a jab, punch is a punch, kicks kick. That stays the same. Body mechanics don't change because the human body doesn't change, right? So, for example, in kung fu or in my specific uh, style, hung guard, there is. Um, this kind of MMA type, it's called Thai, and what it was back in the days, it was an elevated surface, 3x3, three 4x4, three, four four. Um, and two people would fight to stand ground, so it was basically standing the ground. You try to push the other out of the platform, and the purpose was to see if you can hold your ground. If you can't, couldn't hold your ground and you fell off the platform, you could easily get hurt or even get killed. That's also why there were contracts beforehand signed that you are not going to sue the other for any occurring injuries. Like it's 
<clears throat> in modern MMA. You also sign contracts that you're not going to sue the other for injuries. And this is, I think this is something that the people are missing in traditional martial arts because man, it's about fighting. And if you're not honest about what you'll learn, then you need to be clear what you're going to get out. If you're just doing forms, then you will be good at presenting them and performing forms, but you're not going that extra mile of learning the applications of studying your martial art. Man, yo, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you're never going to be good at fighting. Never, ever going to happen. Sorry. Boxing or judo will put two practitioners of the same fighting style against one another. MMA pits two fighters of just about any fighting style imaginable against one another. The result is that it has become an incredibly fertile ground for seeing which martial arts work and those that absolutely do not. Which, in a data-starved field like martial arts, is a godsend for being able to assess the real-world effectiveness of each unique discipline. Striking arts such as boxing and kickboxing and takedown and submission arts such as judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, Sambo and wrestling have all proven it's more like a boy up but okay. With one I'm not sure if he's doing much large but effective against certain foes that use certain styles. A I suppose he does. Able to knock out a master wrestler, but if the wrestler gets him on the ground, the boxer is going to be in big trouble and vice versa. Yeah. John Jones and Habib Nurmagomedov are a testament to this ability to <clears throat> fuse the proven effective styles and dominate their opponents with them. Whilst they each may specialize in a certain discipline, they are both highly skilled at picking the right tools from their toolkit when the moment calls. Thus, MMA has taught the world two revealing aspects of martial arts. The first is that one art is probably not entirely effective on its own. Yes. The second is that a fighter must be able to fight at multiple proximities and heights, at distance and up close on their feet, in the clinch, in the takedown, and on the floor. Ignore any one of these areas of discipline and your opponent will not hesitate to take advantage of it for years. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you look at footage of street fighting, what happens most of the time is you have a couple of seconds standing and then some tumbling and it goes to the ground. And what there comes in BJJ, so one of the best things for actual street fighting is learning BJJ when it gets to the ground. That's really, really, that is something, and also something very good for, for street fighting, for defending yourself. If you don't want to, like, devote yourself or devote a couple of years of learning something really, really to the detail, is pick up a boxing class, a kickboxing class, and learn how to throw a decent low kick. That is one. A decent low kick. No high kicks. Please don't do high kicks anywhere if you should happen to have a street fight. No high kicks. You don't know what the ground is, you can slip, you fall to the ground, bam, it's over. Decent low kick. Some good combinations of a one-two, a trap, cross, and a hook, maybe an uppercut. Learn those, and you're probably better than 99% of all of the people wanting to harass yourself. Yeah. Martial artists only fought against practitioners of their own singular discipline meaning that martial arts were largely designed to provide techniques for attacking and defending against only that very same discipline. This left martial arts with limited avenues for evolution as they weren't being tested for their actual real-world versatility, which is like only ever receiving feedback on your cooking from your own family, whereas the rest of the culinary world would probably tear it apart. This meant that when some martial arts made their debut in MMA, they were very quickly dispatched, and their gaping weaknesses torn wide apart. Sumo wrestling, for instance, was met with a quick reality check when Royce Gracie dismantled <laughs> Akabono Taro. Although an expert sumo wrestler and by far the larger man, Akabono was easily defeated, and Gracie demonstrated how effectively Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu can control a man on the ground and defeat him. This highlights an immediate question. What actually makes a martial art work? Well, the most effective acid test would be this. Does it consistently perform against a completely uncooperative, fully resisting, aggressive opponent? If the answer is no, 
be extremely skeptical about any claims made as to its capabilities. Another concern highlighted by Bruce Lee was whether a martial art actually arms a practitioner with tools and teaches them how and when to use them. Comparing Western boxing to Tai Chi, he said, A boxer, when they concentrate on their two hands, they forget how amateurish they are, and they do their thing. Whereas those guys out there, referring to Tai Chi, they haven't decided what they're going to use. The minute they contact, they don't know what the hell they're going to use. He expanded on this to describe effective fighting as, If you can move with your tools from any angle, then you can adapt to whatever the object is in front of you. The clumsier, the more limited the object, the easier for you to punch on it. That's what it amounts to. This brings us to ineffective martial arts, of which there are many. Yes. Whilst these martial arts have a place in the world and are probably fine for developing discipline, character and fitness, as well as being extremely effective when used against practitioners of their own style, they're generally not effective at actual self-defense or attack for that matter. Mm -hmm. Arts like sumo, wing chun, tai chi, capoeira, and mm -hmm. kung fu have all had troubled reputations at proving their yes. effectiveness. And aside from less mystical branches of kung fu, most of them have little to no reputation in MMA. One Chinese MMA fighter, Zhu Zidong, yeah. was so frustrated with the claims of many of these martial arts, particularly Eastern ones, that he proceeded to challenge the so-called masters. Amongst many victories, he defeated a kung fu master with supposed supernatural powers in 20 seconds. Yeah, I mean, we watched this, we watched um, the documentary about this life. You can find it on the channel. That's really something interesting. Check it out after this one. But what I want to mention here is um, the thing with Xu Xiaodong is, um, yes, for sure, what he does is absolutely good and needs to be supported in all ways to get rid of this fake mass with mystical, chi shitty powers that, oh, God damn it, that's the reason why, <coughs> why, martial arts have such or traditional martial arts have such a bad reputation right because there's one leader that wants to put himself above others by stating that he has some powers that you don't have or some some talents that you don't have and by training his his specific method you could get the same as he so you he can make you stand up others well this sounds we all want to stand out a little bit above the crowd. We want. We all want to be this special snowflake, but it's not the case, man. It's not the case. But what I've heard also as well is that, I mean, there is a community of traditional martial arts people that are not so much on social media because it's not cared, I think. I don't know really. But the people I know fight regularly on a regular basis sparring matches also on tournaments but it's not that a big of a community and nobody of those people knew those so-called masters because man frauds you know and i think also to myself it makes sense when you are in the martial arts for quite some time i mean decades 10 20 30 years and you are legit you thought you are trying the best to do good for your students to really help them to learn martial arts and the good techniques that protects themselves you see if somebody that is coming up that is rising is a fraud or not and then you don't want to hang out for for like some having a good time with them um on tournaments and you also don't invite them to your own tournaments because man reputation again and that's really the thing because i mean for sure a guy who has picked up six months of mma will beat any martial artist that had trained wing chun kung fu tai chi whatever maybe even kickboxing or boxing that has never actually had sparring experience trained for five years no sparring experience a guy that does mma three months will beat the shit out of him that's the key. That's the key takeaway. Really, it is. And it doesn't matter what style you do if you don't expose yourself to stress and that chaotic experience of fighting. It doesn't need to be like 
going brutal, having injuries, a bleeding nose, all this shit. It doesn't need to be this, but subtle and slow changes rising up the level of stress to see what works and what doesn't. That is necessary for martial arts to work. Let's go. Flat. And a winged Chun Master in 1 minute 48 seconds into the first round. Even though the man was 26 and a half pounds heavier. Whilst experts in their art, neither was capable of even remotely defending themselves against Looking a capable, like resisting, aggressive opponent. Sadly, for Zoom, yeah, and another thing, sorry, I want to make clear here is it depends on your personality. What I see in sparring, I have a guy, um, he's like 56, 56 years old, maybe 20 kilos lighter than me, but he has. He's a guy from, I think, Brazil, and he has a completely different mentality or personality. He is, he's really outgoing, per se, where he's coming from, that's how the people are, and it's totally fine, but he's really outgoing, he's really bam, 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 really going for it, and in sparring, he's always, we call it, he's very hard, so he's, <clears throat> he's like this, maybe that's because of his um rugby background where it's coming handy but he despite that having two to three years less of experience he can overwhelm me by aggression and that's something that i learned that i need to work on because man you can overwhelm people by just putting stress and stress and stress and going forward you can overwhelm almost anybody if you have this mindset this character trait from the beginning that is something good but it also can be a little bit different or difficult to then go into the details of being loose and punching explosive and what i want to get you is that it really is a difference in mindset when you talk about sparring because really you can easily overwhelm someone with this by just putting the pressure on, don't stop. The, it really, that's possible. <laughs> I experienced it. <laughs> really, I don't know what you need else. Maybe, yeah. I should, maybe we should, we should record some of those things. And by the way, I have a sparring playlist down in the video description below. I'm not a pro. I'm just wanting to share what I think is valuable for, especially the Kung Fu community that I see. God damn it. You need to get your gloves up, headgear up, and then go for it. And if that interests you, also down in the comments. The result was the Chinese Communist Party docking his social credit score so much that he yeah. couldn't afford basic living or travel costs, and he was publicly harassed, assaulted, and barred from his own gym. This also yeah. highlights a key issue. That really, many you, watch watch the reaction for this. Poor That's star. crazy. Technique is continually practiced against a compliant, non-resisting opponent. Meaning that yeah. you and the technique itself are God damn it. ill equipped. Need to interrupt again. <laughs> what he says is 100 percent true. Because there are different kinds of sparring. You can have point sparring, you can have full force sparring, you can have just body shots. Everything has a different purpose. But what sparring is not, it's not drills. Drills is something completely different. That's what he says is compliant drills are for learning a technique and when you have learned this in class with your classmates you have drilled the techniques then you need to go with that experience with this feeling with this muscle connection with this mind muscle connection into sparring and see how you can apply it now with a little more resistance then building up on this that is what a drill is for a drill is not sparring sparring is always at some level chaotic maybe a little bit more maybe a little bit less but it needs to be chaotic a drill is something that is always in the same manner to give you an understanding of certain principles and concepts of your martial arts that is very very important to distinguish separate things drills sparring okay for a real world confrontation this extends to so-called self-defense martial arts like Krav Maga, 
Whilst these techniques have been designed by Never tried. to work in combat zones, they also rely on incredibly dangerous attacks such as eye gouging, attacking an opponent in the scrotum, and disarming them of a knife only to stab them with it in the heart. Whilst these may be effective, there is no way for you to properly train such techniques in sparring with a resisting opponent without maiming or killing them. To say nothing of the fact that your sparring partner would always have to be very compliant for you to even pull off these manoeuvres at non-dangerous speeds. These martial arts also beg the question, what's the actual point of defending yourself if you end up landing yourself in prison on manslaughter or GBH charges? What's effective in a life or death battlefield scenario isn't very Letting necessary for everyday life. In 99% of scenarios, simply having the fitness and motivation to run away would probably be far more effective and intelligent. Another point worth mentioning is that there Yeah, or having like a solid combination of one, two, an uppercut, a hook, and some solid low kicks, and then the fitness to really run. Yeah. Basic self-defense one-on-one, -on -one, because self-defense, goddammit, is a legal term. There's a lot more to fighting itself than just knowing techniques. Your courage, physical size, fitness, and experience oh, have goddamn, more yeah. bearing on the actual result of the confrontation than the knowledge of technique. You might know how to perform an eye gouge, but let's see you do that against a big, aggressive man who's fought and won hundreds of pub scraps during his life. But sure, perhaps you might be able to pull it off as he uppercuts you into the middle of next week. But beyond ineffective martial arts techniques, there are some martial arts that are just out and out fake. So fake, in fact, that they border on hilarious lunacy. The deeper you go into the world of martial arts, the stranger things become. Uh, he's showing Cabrera now. Things are more bizarre than claims of no touch knockouts by harnessing yeah, come powers on. and using psychic manipulation. One martial art called Balinese Yellow Bamboo claims to blast people with god-charged beams of chi as a method of self-defense. Guy is running at you with a meat cleaver? No worries, just blast him with chi. Naturally, when put to the... I really don't know who is falling for this on this goddamn world, really. Can you explain this to me? What? Who believes this? Really? I, I don't get it. ...test by real trained fighters, the Yellow Bamboo Fighters, failed to deploy the necessary chi. Yeah, what a surprise. <laughs> Yanagi Ryukan, an Aikido master and pioneer on Daito Ryukan yeah, Aikido, made bag. repeated claims that he could physically manipulate his environment and not yeah, his own students, yeah. without touching them. However, when confronted by journalist and fighter Irakura Tsuyoshi, he was rapidly dispatched. And left the battle oh, bow, bow, later bow. claiming his defeat. Give him sour. Likewise, George Dillman. A oh, yeah, the man, the con man himself. For his no touch knockout chi power, described another's failure to fall victim to his technique by saying they had put their tongue in the wrong position and that they. Yeah, were that's, that's a classic, man. That's a classic. Why do these bizarre techniques practiced by entire dojos of students? I don't know if I should say this on film, but maybe if the guy had his tongue in the wrong position, he could also nullify it. <laughs> I watched this a trillion times. <laughs> to so many, and why do they seem to work when the master practices them on his students? And how on earth do these masters delude themselves that they work? Well, the psychology of no-touch knockouts has a lot to do with Dillman's comments on being a non-believer. It turns out, if you're a believer, you likely will be knocked down by these no-touch attacks. In fact, Dillman has convinced yeah, kind of dozens yeah. of students that he can knock them down and out without ever touching them. It's remarkably similar to techniques employed by gangs, religions and cults, that is, vulnerable people are offered safety and a sense of belonging. The more they invest their lives into the group, the more they double down on their belief, the more it becomes part of their identity. This leads to a complete lack of questioning of the master and the tradition, an increasing reliance on the group and its training, and an increased alienation from real life. 
Well, the problem with this is that when you have like this vulnerable people, they're searching for a solution and you as the cult leader or the fake martial arts masters is providing this solution for sure you are not going to question him or her or his style of teaching because that would make them the blame on yourself because you have fallen for it and you suddenly see god damn it that is not the solution and your whole world is falling apart i mean who in the goddamn world has the character and the strength for this coming from a from a dark place Having a solution, you finally feel like, oh man, I have something now for myself. You are in an upward spiral, it's going better and better, to then realize, god damn it, that's not right, and going straight back to the black hole. Who's gonna do that? Well, I don't know if I would have the character strength to do this. I don't know. And I'm not sure if 99% of the people out there having this either because that is something really really hard so we need to make sure that we educate ourselves beforehand to see red flags out there what is good and what not what can we follow what shouldn't we follow that's the purpose of this channel here moral social and dress codes are enforced and rival groups are talked about like they're enemies Perhaps most interesting of all is that when people in these groups are confronted with a reality that disproves the group's premise, they don't renounce it, they simply double down on their beliefs. This results in two things. One, the fake martial arts practitioner becomes completely compliant to the nonsense techniques and lets himself get flung around by psychic powers. And two, the master comes to believe his own nonsense. And as is the case of Yanagi Ryoken, living out a power fantasy kept alive by vulnerable people who are easily manipulated, until he ends up having a brutal reunion with reality. These masters are no more than con men who got fooled by their own con. An interesting paper by Gillian Russell talks about this, and she boils it all down to a concept she calls epistemic viciousness, meaning the possession of vices that makes one bad at acquiring true beliefs or gives one a tendency to form false ones. Is this some sort of research? This inclination towards epistemic viciousness is If I find it, I'm gonna link it down in the description for you. Because of their you. close-mindedness, reliance on tradition, and failure to adequately confront reality. This goes not just for fake martial arts, but the ineffective ones I mentioned earlier. Is a Tai Chi or Krav Maga expert with no real-world experience in fighting actually qualified to defend himself, let alone teach others to? And is teaching others a non-effective defense technique actually dangerous? To illustrate epistemic viciousness, she uses the example of her 11-year-old self being taught by her karate master that if she trained a straight punch for three years, she could kill a bull with a single strike. Yeah, which come on. Is obviously ludicrous and would probably result in her vicious mauling. Which brings me to my next point. Fake martial arts are incredibly dangerous. And the fake martial artists who create them, even more so. John Timothy Keon, otherwise known Can't as the <laughs> yes, <created> man. <laughs> the Dim Man, or Death. Why do I know all these people? <laughs> and peddled it to unsuspecting teenagers in comic book magazine adverts who didn't know any better. He became so successful and so lost within his own fantasy that he would instigate dojo wars, one of which led to the murder of his student. Another man, Raphael. I mean, Count Dante and also, and also George Stillman. They are successful. I mean, the people want to believe, so there is some sort of legitimacy that the people want to see this. They are willing to pay to see what this is about, to find a solution to the problem, and to find out what, what, how they can solve their problem that we spoke about earlier they are rich they are goddamn rich i'm i'm sure in the video that we saw there was talking about that george Tillman is actually a millionaire because of all his books that he sold and all the things right and you can't successful successful with this shit yeah that's that's a sad story about it 
was a supposed BJJ expert who was initially extremely famous in the world of mixed martial arts. However, when he actually participated in a real fight that he thought for some reason he could win, that's a BJJ dude, that's Capoeira again, and shown to have little skill in BJJ. In fact, it wasn't till years later that he pulled off a real rear naked choke against a truly resisting opponent when he murdered his lover's husband. Or consider actor Mickey Rourke, oh, whose claims to being a former boxer were backed up by a record that couldn't be found, and an opponent who claims to have been paid to take a dime. Whilst not being a danger to others, why he'd go to such lengths to lie about being a fighter and then endanger himself by doing so is beyond anyone. However, I don't want to end this video on a dour note of dangerous practices and deceptive martial arts masters. Instead, I'd like you to take from this one clear lesson, not just for martial arts, but for life in general. Oh, Never we're going take down. anything as proven when you haven't seen evidence of it being proven time and time again. Never trust a master who claims to know everything but never actually backs it up with evidence, and always mm -hmm. question the beliefs that have been driven into your head by others. That is, unless it's me who's put them there, in which case <laughs> you should believe and serve unquestioningly. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider supporting me on Patreon because it really helps me to continue to make these videos. The link's in the description below. Also, if you'd like to get your hands on a first edition signed copy of my new book, Stick of Wagon It, A Thousand Years of Bizarre History from Britain and Beyond, then head on over to Unbound Publishing, the link's in the description, and pre-order yours today. Thank you. That was really a good video, really a good video. So the links will be down below also the original video. Please check him out. Also leave a comment and leave a like on his video. And really, I wonder, this is really something that I want from my heart. What do you think about when you reflect your own martial arts style, no matter what you do for a style, what do you see? I think there's always one or two bad things in a martial art that you can find in literally everything. And a ton of good stuff that you can state. So I, I wonder what do you see when we have such a video now? What do you see in your martial art that is maybe a little fraudulent or bad practice or whatever? Write me down in the comments so that also other people can see what other styles are about, what maybe is good, what maybe is bad. And this is really, this is, this is really what wonders me, really. And I would say like and share, comment down below. Let's see you in the next one when it's again another episode of Sunday Documentary React. Peace out.